Welcome to the online worship of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Scarborough. Whether you're a longtime member or are joining us for the very first time today, you are welcome. Just a couple of announcements for the congregation, two deadlines. Uh, a reminder that submissions to the annual report are due in by the end of the month, uh, preferably in electronic form by email to the church office to Joanna. Uh, the second deadline for our next newsletter, it's going to be going out in February. Uh, the deadline for submissions is February the 4th, and we'd ask you to send those to Mark Daly, our newsletter editor. Now let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves for worship. Psalm 67 is a prayer, a prayer that the nations of the earth and all its peoples would praise the Lord, that they would know his way, that they would experience his saving power. Our opening song this morning echoes that prayer, may the peoples praise you.
Let us pray. O oh God, our God, we long for you. We long for those days when we could be together to be in this place together to worship you. And so from whatever four walls we call our own, we call out to you now as those who know the name, who love the name, who praise the name of Jesus. For he is our Redeemer. He is our refuge, our hope our companion on the journey, the one who embodied God with us. And Lord, it's in the midst of this journey that we call out to you. And it's from the midst of this journey that we confess to you. We confess that we have despaired. We confess that we've become weary. We confess that we have grumbled. We confess that at times we may even have lost faith. And so we pray this morning that you would restore us. That you would extend your mercy over us that you would refresh us with your grace. Grant to us, we pray, in your presence the rest and the hope and the peace we need to face the day. Help us to know again the sweetness of trusting in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We know that some of our St. Andrew's kids have been joining us uh, for worship each week. And so this week we've included one of their music videos, uh, an old song with a fresh face, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 to 30. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that day, in that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him. What are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of, of it as you need, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, as much as each needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until, 
until morning. So they put it aside until morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not become foul, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. This is the word of the Lord to us. Thanks be to God. These days, mindfulness gurus will often tell you that in order to manage your stress, you need to find your happy place. And that happy place often begins as an actual physical place, one that is associated with great memories or great contentment, great joy, or great peace. For me, that would probably be our cottage or pretty much any place in Galilee. Next, your happy place becomes somewhere that you can go to in your imagination, a place that lets you slip out of your immediate reality, those same four walls that you've been staring at for the last 10 months, and be somewhere else, at least for a few moments, until the stress levels begin to come down and your blood pressure returns to normal. If you were to ask the people of ancient Israel at this stage of their journey from Egyptian slavery to God's shalom to describe their happy place, I think they'd probably tell you about Elim. Elim was where we left them last Sunday. And Exodus 15 describes Elim as a place of 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. Think of Elim as being like a Caribbean vacation, and the only thing lacking is the beach, although they probably had plenty of sand. Elim was an oasis in the midst of the wilderness, the kind of place that you long for, that you can't wait to get to, that you hate to leave, Elam could easily have been someone's happy place. But as we pick up the chronicle of, of Exodus this morning, we find that God's people are being told that it's time to move on. The reality of life is that we don't get to stay at the beach, or, or on the mountaintop, or at Elim, or any of those high points indefinitely. And so the people of Israel head off into the wilderness once again. And this is also what the life of discipleship looks like. So often it's wilderness, oasis, then wilderness again. There's no stopping anywhere for very long. Sure, we're granted moments, we're granted seasons, we're granted those high points and those mountain tops, but those are there to sustain us. Those are there to renew us. Those are there not as somewhere that we are meant to stay, but so that we can be revived for the journey that yet lies ahead. We see that even in the rhythm of the week, if we do it the way that God intends. Six days we face the world. On the seventh day, we rest. 
Six days of wilderness, one day of oasis. A day to be renewed, a day to be revived, a day to be restored so that once again you and I can journey with God. We see how seriously God takes that rhythm in our scripture for this morning. I'm jumping ahead a bit here, but when the Lord promises to supply the Israelites with manna, he makes the provision that on the sixth day they will be able to gather enough for two days. So that on the seventh day, they won't even have to do that much work. And on the seventh day, there was no manna. The word Sabbath means to cease, to stop, to come to a halt. And on the Exodus, even the manna did that. And you and I are meant to as well. Not because we have to, but because it's good for us to do so. Sabbath rightly seen is a blessing. Sabbath is God's gift to us. The Lord Jesus reminded us of that when he taught that you and I weren't made for the Sabbath, but rather the Sabbath was made for us. And I have to say that for all the, the tragedy and, and the hardship and pain that this pandemic has brought, it has also come with a few blessings, with a few lessons, with a, a few teachable moments. And one of them for me has been this lesson about the importance of Sabbath, of, of having a day to experience the oasis of God, a day to be in Elim, a day that's different, a day of not striving or working or worrying, but resting. A day when we take a break from the world because that day was given to us by God. And I'm not usually one for New Year's resolutions, but I do believe that an occasional resolution is necessary, especially when it is a resolution to live more closely, more in tune with the rhythm that God wills for my life. And if your life has seemed to become all wilderness and no oasis, all world and little God, maybe it's time for you to consider a new resolution too. And that's, call it sermon number one for this morning. Claim your time at the oasis. But there's more. Exodus 16 begins with the whole people of Israel heading off into the wilderness once again. And we are no more than a couple of verses into this passage before the complaining begins. Think of it as having just pulled out of the driveway and already you're hearing from the back seat, are we there yet? And if you think that comparing the complaints of the people of Israel to childhood whining is a little over the top. Listen again to the drama of the Israelites' complaints. Verse 3, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, but you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill us with hunger. As a pastor, as a parent, as I think any leader would want to say, oh, come on, really? That's the plan? To have God perform miracle after miracle in order to convince Pharaoh to let you go? To have the Egyptians shower you with wealth and supplies as you head off onto your journey? 
to have you pass through the sea on dry ground with Pharaoh's troops in hot pursuit, only to have the waters come crashing in just as you reach dry land, to have bitter water turned to sweet at Merah because that's precisely what you needed at that moment, to take you to an oasis like Elim to give you rest and refreshment only to walk you just a little further out into the wilderness in order to kill you with hunger? That was the plan? Of course that wasn't the plan. Any primetime detective could have told them that if God had wanted them dead, they would have been dead already. So of course that wasn't the plan. Not Moses' plan as a leader. Not God's plan either. And that's really all that matters. It was not God's plan to let them die of hunger. And they ought to have known that. But that didn't stop the grumbling. And sadly, it doesn't stop ours either, does it? Grumbling is just something we do. I once read that as Canadians, we do more grumbling about two things, our government and our weather, than the people of any other developed nation on earth. But whether it comes out as, as anger or frustration or disappointment or sorrow, our grumbling almost always finds its source in one thing, unmet expectations. We thought things would be one way, and yet, for some reason, they turn out rather differently. And if on occasion we find ourselves grumbling about the plans of God, and, and if we're honest, I think we have to all say that at times we do, maybe it's actually our expectations that need to be reevaluated. Maybe what we need is actually a clearer picture of God's plans. So what do we know about the plans of God? In general terms, we know what we read in scriptures like Jeremiah 29 and Romans 8. Jeremiah includes these words from God. For surely I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. And Romans offers us this promise. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Now that doesn't mean that the way to this hope-filled future will always be easy. Or that our good will always be accomplished through a life that's pain-free. That's not what God is saying. Rather, the promise of God is simply this, that his plans always mean that the end result will be worth it. In the life of ancient Israel, those plans meant that although they had to trek through the wilderness for more than a generation, God's people would ultimately cross over into the promised land. And that promised land, a, a place of rest, a land flowing with milk and honey, was meant at least in part to be a kind of foretaste of what God's ultimate plan for his people would be. The book of Hebrews says, So then... A Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. In other words, there is another rest, another promised land, one that still awaits us and all those who put themselves into the hands of Jesus. And this is God's plan for us, that we would find that rest, that we would ultimately be with him. That's the promise that Jesus makes to us on the night before the crucifixion. He says, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, 
there you may be also. But later on that same night, Jesus also said this, I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, though, you will face tribulation. But do not be discouraged, for I have overcome the world. The plans of God are always full of promise. But that doesn't mean that the way forward will always be smooth. The plans of God are always for our good, even when for a while they place us in the wilderness. And if that's where we find ourselves this morning, trekking through the wilderness, whatever that wilderness for you might be, the remedy for the grumbling that we so often find so tempting is for us to keep the end in sight. So that's sermon number two. Number one, claim your time at the oasis. Number two, keep the end in sight. And that brings us to the last sermon for this morning. And we find this in the lesson of the manna. And the manna's lesson would simply be this. As you make your way through the wilderness, trust God for today. That's it. Trust God for today. It's worth noting that no sooner does the grumbling begin than God reveals to Moses the next part of his plan. The people are hungry. God says, I am going to rain bread from heaven. But, and this is a point that the passage makes repeatedly, only enough bread for today. What was it that Jesus taught us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. There's just one exception to this rule about only enough for today. On the sixth day, God provided twice as much as the people needed. Why? So that they wouldn't have to collect it on the seventh day. So they wouldn't have to collect it on that Sabbath that we've already talked about. That's how seriously God takes our need for Sabbath, our need for that time at the Oasis. Even in that respect, God's provision matches his people's need. Now you might think, but isn't God just rewarding their grumbling? They start to whine and so God does what he has to do in order to get the whining to stop. But that would only be the case if God hadn't been planning to feed them all along. And we know that's not the case. God had no intention of saving them from the Egyptians only to let them die of starvation. Rather, God's timing was meant to demonstrate one thing. In the evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord. God's provision was meant to demonstrate in a daily way that he was with them. That he would not abandon them. That he would accompany them throughout their journey. That he would see them through to the end. Each day was meant to begin and end with that realization. Each day was meant to begin and end with trust. Of course, that doesn't always happen. Even though God's instructions were so incredibly specific, the people still try to do it their own way. They try to hoard the manna for more than one day, but that doesn't work. Then they're told that none will be available on the seventh day, but they go out looking for it anyway. After all God has done for them, they still don't trust him enough to listen to what he says. But they're not alone in that, are they? How often do you and I insist on, on trying to do things our own way? 
How often do we insist on charting our own course, developing our own plan? How often do we try to, to work around what God has so clearly said instead of simply obeying? And what does that say about our trust? It seems that what we need is a daily reminder of what John Calvin said so long ago. That it is better for us to limp along the path of God's word than to dash with all speed outside of it. And yes, that may mean that the journey takes us longer and that the going at times may be harder. But it also means that the, the path that we're following is safe, that it is reliable, that it is trustworthy. That it's truly taking us to where we really want to go. And Jesus himself reminds us of that. He says, wide is the gate and broad the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. In other words, if the world seems to be going one way, there's a very good chance that you and I should be going the other. Trusting God for the destination means trusting God for today. It means trusting him for each step of the journey. It means renewing that trust morning and evening. The lesson of the manna, trust God for today. So, three sermons for whatever wilderness you may find yourselves in the midst of this morning. Number one, claim your time at the oasis. Let God truly give you his Sabbath rest. Number two, keep the end in sight. That's how the rough spots in the journey become something that we can face. And number three, trust God for today. Trust that his word is and always will be the safest path for us to follow. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for your word to us today. In the ebb and flow of life, we find ourselves at different places along this discipleship journey. We thank you for nourishing us at the oases of life where by your grace our needs are met our souls are nourished and we grow more aware of your awesome love and compassion for us in the hustle and bustle of our lives it's easy for us to wander right by these oases when our priorities are elsewhere would you prompt us to take the time to stop and rest at the oases that you provide for us so that in caring for ourselves we'll be better able to care for others and on this sabbath day may we find refreshment rest and recreation once again to prepare us for the week ahead Father, we admit that we're often prone to whining about the, both the small irritations and the big frustrations in our lives. When obstacles confront us, rather than counting our blessings, we resort to complaining and criticizing just like the Israelites did. Lord, we sometimes don't recognize your steady hand upon our lives. Forgive us, Lord, and lead us to a more nuanced understanding of your grace in the ups and downs of life. Give us eyes to see your hand at work in the world 
and the faith to trust in your plans for us. When our anxiety threatens to undo us, help us to remember your promises to us. May we learn to keep the promised end in sight. When our unfiltered thoughts overwhelm us, remind us to tell ourselves the truth about you. Just as the Israelites had to learn to follow your instructions to ensure that they had enough to eat every day, so we too need to learn to trust that you will provide for our daily needs too. May we learn that it's in faithful obedience to your commandments to us that you will bless us and we will experience the shalom that we all long for. Merciful God, how can the COVID-19 pandemic not be still top of our minds? It seems that we're moving two steps forward and one step back in the fight against this invisible enemy. We're grateful for the progress that has been made so far in lowering the infection rate in Toronto. At the same time, we're anxious because there's going to be a delay in delivering the promised vaccines, which upsets the vaccination plans already in place. We're always mindful of the frail and vulnerable seniors in retirement and nursing homes where COVID-19 is still spreading quickly and so many are dying. Our hearts also go out to those who are struggling financially due to the loss of their jobs or the closure of their businesses or their own lack of sick benefits. We pray that the right kind of financial assistance will be available to each one so that they can meet their financial responsibilities and find new jobs or sources of income. Today, we especially pray for healing for all those who have COVID-19 and especially for those for whom the virus has run right through a whole family. We pray for all the staff working tirelessly on the front lines who must be feeling physically, emotionally, and spiritually overwhelmed at times. Would you encourage them in the heroic, sacrificial work that they're doing? Strengthen them mentally and physically and protect them from becoming infected with COVID-19 themselves. May we, in our own communities, be the hands and feet of Jesus to those who need encouragement, a listening ear, or a little more support at this time. Remind us that each of us can reach out and do small things for others with great love in the name of Jesus. Father, as the Toronto schools are not able to restart this coming week, we pray for renewed stamina and patience for the teachers, students, and parents who must juggle so many responsibilities at home and online. Their task is daunting. May we demonstrate our love for one another by respecting the public health measures that have been put in place to protect all of us. And as we look ahead, Father God, we ask you to give us renewed hope and optimism for the future. In this new year, we're so thankful for the peaceful transfer of power this past Wednesday in the United States. And we look forward to the promise of more vaccines to come and more vaccinations to be done. Above all, Lord, we're thankful that even though we don't know the future, we do know you, the one who holds the future. And knowing you to be the hope of the world is enough. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Last Wednesday, incoming President Biden promised the American people that his whole soul would be in the task that had been entrusted to him. 
His declaration reminded me that as Christians, we too are called to be completely engaged in our mission that has been entrusted to us. To love the Lord our God with all our hearts and with all our souls, with all our minds and with all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're engaged in Christ's mission in the world in so many ways through our love for our neighbors and our passion to serve others, as well as through the wise stewardship of our time, talents, and resources. By regularly and generously giving to the work of St. Andrews, we're not only able to support the worship and the work of our local church, but we're also able to support the work of the church in our broader context, such as in First Nations communities, in church planting, in youth work, as well as in programs for marginalized people in our own community and in communities around the world. It's in this engagement with others that we find God's blessing as we're able to participate in the work of God in bringing in his kingdom. There can be no greater joy in giving than this. So let's ask God now to bless us in our giving. Let us pray. Father, we extend our arms and open our hands to present our offerings to you from hearts overflowing with gratitude for all your many gifts to us, freely given. Through our gifts, Would you bring life and hope to many in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is Lord of All Power. It's a hymn of rededication that begins like this. Lord of all power, I give you my will in joyful obedience your task to fulfill. Your bondage is freedom, your service is song, and held in your keeping, my weakness is strong. Let's sing this beautiful hymn together.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.